Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome to Case Western Reserve University's Homecoming and Reunion Weekend. I'm very excited to join you for a conversation with Dr. Marla Perez Davis, hosted by the CWRU Latinx Alumni Association. My name is Shami Williams, and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement. Uh, also joining me is my colleague, Crystal Crosby, Assistant Director for Student Young Alumni and Affinity Programs. I'm sure many of you know her. Um, before we get to the program, I just want to give a few housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted by default. Um, we ask that you please remain muted to limit background noise during the presentations. And so that we know who you are, please make sure your name appears correctly in this meeting. You can rename yourself by clicking on participants, finding your name, and then using the more option and selecting rename. And finally, if you could please uh, turn on your video, it'd be great to see your faces. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Torres. He is the president of the Latinx Alumni Association. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, thank you, Crystal, as well, for all your help in organizing this event. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew Torres. I'm the president of the Latinx Alumni Association. I graduated from the university in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in political science. A little bit about the Latinx Alumni Association. Uh, we uh, began in 2017 and really our, uh, our uh, intention with the group was to be able to create a space for Latinx alumni to come together for fellowship and, and professional resources um, and, and just to have fun too, right? And so I think that this, uh, like a, an event like this uh, sort of combines those, those, all those uh, themes. Um, I'm going to introduce our um, moderator or our host and our guest for today. Um, so please join me in welcoming Alberto Gonzalez Campos. Alberto, is, as we know him, uh, Beto graduated from the university with his degrees in aerospace and mechanical engineering, uh, his bachelor's in 2018 and his master's in 2020. Uh, he's originally from Monterrey, Mexico, and he's a current board member of the Latinx Alumni Association, and we're very uh, happy to have him. Throughout his academic career at Case Western, he did extensive wind turbine research at the Control and Energy Systems Center, being selected as a Think Energy Fellow for the Great Lakes Energy Institute. And additionally, he has continuously engaged and actively collaborated for more inclusive and diverse STEM campus community. He did this through our organizations on campus, like the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, also known as SHIP, uh, and La Alianza. He uh, was a student coordinator in the Office of Multicultural Affairs, or the OMA, and he also uh, has interests in experimental aerodynamics. Um, he would like to continue his career in the renewables industry and energy sector while representing his culture, heritage, and most importantly, his Latino community every single day. Uh, so thank you to Beto for hosting and, and speaking with Dr. Perez Davis today. Uh, for Dr. Perez Davis, I would like to introduce her by saying that she serves as the director of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA's uh, John H. Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. In this position, she's responsible for planning, organizing, and directing the activities required in accomplishing the missions assigned to the center. The Glenn staff consists of more than 3,200 civil service and support contractor employees and has an annual budget of more than $900 million. Prior to becoming the director, Dr. Perez Davis served as NASA's NASA Glenn's deputy director. From June 2014 to June 2016, she was deputy director of the research and engineering directorate. And in this position, Perez Davis was responsible for leading, planning, coordinating, and managing all phases of Glenn's research and engineering activities to accomplish NASA missions. Dr. Perez Davis is the recipient of numerous NASA awards, including the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal and the prestigious Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Executives. He was also the recipient of the 2015 Cranes Women of Note, the Top 25 Elite Business Women, Hispanic Business Magazine, Women of Color Career Achievement, Distinguished Alumni Award, Alumni Association of Puerto Rico Mayaguez, Women in Aerospace Award for Aerospace Awareness, Women of Color Technology Award for Career Achievement, and the Hispanic Engineer National Achievement Santiago Rodriguez Diversity Award. He's also a certified NASA Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. Dr. Perez Davis, a native of Puerto Rico, engaged, uh, I'm sorry, earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Puerto Rico, a master's of science degree from the University of Toledo, and a doctoral degree from Case Western Reserve University in chemical engineering. 
In 2006, she completed NASA's Senior Executive Service Candidate Development Program and the Office of Personnel Management Program. So without further ado, please join me in giving a virtual applause to Beto and uh, Dr. Perez Davis. I will applaud myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so yeah, it's an honor for me to be here today and have this conversation with Dr. Perez Davis. Um, as a fellow engineer, it is a privilege for me to ask you some questions, have a conversation about your past experiences, life stories, um, and introduce you also as a fellow um, to other case alumni, uh, alumni um, members and the community at large. Um, before we start to the audience, uh, please feel free to write your questions in the chat throughout our conversation, um, and we will get to those during the Q&A section at the end. So today, I would like to focus on three main themes or topics, as you might say. Uh, first, your challenges, um, uh, Dr. Perez Davis, personal, social, cultural. Uh, second, your professional and personal growth. Um, and third, your role in mentorship and community-related activities. Uh, so starting with your challenges, um, I did my little bit of research and you mentioned uh, in previous interviews how important it was for you to develop your technical skills in engineering, taking research opportunities, uh, starting your junior year of college, uh, which ignited your passion for applied sciences, math, and especially chemistry. So can you tell us more about uh, you growing up in Puerto Rico and in what way that heritage, uh, personal values, and, and successes benefited you in, as a young professional? Alberto, Andrew, and everyone else, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this session today. Um, hola, buenas tardes. Um, <laughs> so um, again, it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be talking to all of you. So, um, you know, many of you will relate to this. Um, you know, I uh, was born and, and raised in Puerto Rico, and, and one of the things was, you know, the, the family um, aspects. Um, you know, my mom, I have two other sisters, so my mom raised, you know, three, three girls. And my, my mom always, you know, was um, very strict to, say, to tell you the truth in terms of, you know, you have to have an education. Um, that was key. You got to have an education. And I think, you know, um, reflecting back, I think, you know, we talk about goals and objectives that we all have to have that vision, that goal. Obviously, I was uh, very young, but one thing that I learned um, that I have to have that determination, that resilience, because things were not going to be easy. And, and I think, you know, that's one thing that I have carried. Um, there's time, and you all can identify with this because this is life, right? Um, things are going well, and then things don't go that well. And the question is, you know, how you confront those realities and how you learn from that. Um, and sometimes the setbacks are big setbacks. And, but you have to find, you know, the will within to move forward. So I think, you know, growing up, my mom said, hey, you got to have an education. Um, education is first. So I think that's how we started, you know, setting goals and the motivation to do something. Now, there was no, not saying you have to be an engineer. Tell you the truth, there was not that many role models um, or engineers. I mean, I'm from a small town in Puerto Rico um, at Juntas. And it's in the middle of the island. Um, there was not that many engineers. And to tell you the truth, there was not a single chemical engineer. I didn't know a single chemical engineer. There was civil engineer, only one. Um, but for some reason, you know, I was always into the math and the science. And one good day, I decided that I was going to be a chemical engineer. I could have been so wrong about selecting that. But at the same time, there's something to say about what are those things that you're passionate about? that you really resonate with and that you're good with. You identify those things and you go for it, you cannot, make, you cannot go wrong. Because even when things don't go your way, you always have this desire that you, know, you can and you will. And I think those are two big drivers in terms of you know, growing up in Puerto Rico. So you know, engineering, you all know, especially if you have been in engineering um, classes, is you know, kind of tough. And, um, you go back when I was going um, through engineering school, one of the things that um, was different for me when I came to the States is that, you know, being in Puerto Rico, yes, there was, you know, the uh, um, male, female kind of thing, but it was not, um, it was like more kind of a competition, a good competition in terms of the classes, but there was not, I never felt like, you know, there was a differentiation. 
And to tell you the truth, I didn't know that much about being a minority because we were all in the same, you know, kind of the same group. Uh, when I came to the state, then I start understanding more about, you know, your, your minority on top of that, you know, you're a female uh, in an engineering field. So, you know, there are certain things that you have to own. And one of them is you have to prepare yourself. And uh, education, again, comes back as something that you have to, to make sure that you stay with it. You, you graduate from any fields and in a year after, things have changed. It's just the way things go. Technology is changing so fast that you really have to make an effort to stay up to speed in terms of, you know, continuous education. Doesn't matter which field. So when I started with NASA, I had the opportunity to um, continue my education. So I continued my education mainly because I was in the research area. And one of the things that, you know, you look around and just say, well, you're in the research area. There's a lot of people that have, you know, PhDs. Is that something that you would like to do? And, you know, I was kind of um, in the continuous education. I finished my master and I had the opportunity. So all about opportunities to continue my education and go for the PhD program. And so that's how I finished with, with Case. Um, you know, great opportunity. Um, I embraced that opportunity and, you know, I uh, finished my, uh, my doctorate degree at, at Case. Uh, it was not easy and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, those differences because again, um, every time that you take a step, you master something, right? But then there's certain things that you now are new and you have to get good at, you gotta understand, and you have to understand also what are the strengths and the weaknesses as you move through your career, because that's what is gonna keep you um, competitive, but it's also gonna keep you, know, you motivated and inspired to do the next thing. Um, there's gonna be challenges all the time. There's no question about that. Yeah, that makes, yeah, a, lot that makes a lot of sense. Actually, actually, um, so I relate, so I relate a, lot a lot for me. For me my, from um, Ray, and then back to college here in the States, it was a huge understanding of, I came here for my education, and part of the Latino mm -hmm. heritage is, through your education, you can be a better person, not just a better engineer, but a better person through your education experience. So I wanted to learn more about, you mentioned it was not, you know, easy transition from where you were in Puerto Rico to University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and then from there directly here to Cleveland. So those transition moments, uh, could be really hard. And then you also mentioned in the past that you first thought it was a five-year experience only here at NASA, and then it mm -hmm. extended all the way to 30 plus years. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, can you tell more about that relocation story? You talk about the struggles and, mm -hmm. and how education keeps you on track, but how, how do you feel? How was that experience and your ability to adapt? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the other part of, you know, that transition is Obviously, my, my first language is Spanish. And, and, you know, we learn English, right, from books and for practicing in classes, but really you're not speaking English all the time. So I think, you know, that was probably and still the thing that I struggled the most um, because it's not the same thing when you're reading the books, the majority of the books, if they're all, were in English. So you have the understanding of the terms, the technical terms. You know, you can understand when you read, but then when I came here, people are used to speak like, you know, very fast. And it was like, oh, well, can you slow down? Um, the other thing, some of the words, right? You learn words from the book. And, you know, I always remember one good day I was asking someone for soda, right? Because I, yeah. I learned soda. I, I just want some Coke or Pepsi or something like that. I asked for soda. Everybody would look at me like, what in the world is she asking for? Um, funny thing. They said, you know, someone finally got it and said, oh, she wants a pop. I said, pop, what is that? So I think, you know, there's, you know, some stories about that, but it, it's just a transition. Um, and it's challenging, it's difficult, and it's frustrating too. Because sometimes, you know, you want to communicate in a way that you, you, you can, because again, by the time you have your thought put together, it's kind of the timing has passed. So I think, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, you got to adapt and you got to, you know, understand that's a weakness and, and you got to not let that be kind of a, a frustrating, to a frustrating point that you cannot pass that. Um, so I think, you know, the language is, has been one. Um, the, the other thing is family and friends. Um, when I came here, obviously, I didn't know anyone. Um, 
which is, you know, right now my friends became my extended family because you develop a strong bond with the people that are around you um, that becomes your friend. And it doesn't matter, you know, um, if they are from, you know, um, Hispanic background or not, they become your extended family. And I was very fortunate to have a circle of people that were very inclusive, um, people that have come also from the island that were here, that they kind of help you succeed and succeed in all areas. It's not just about the professional, but also, you know, the personal, make sure that, you know, they, they talk to you, they, they show you the robes. Um, and I think, you know, there's a relationship um, with that in term of the workplace too. You know, the networks that you develop, they're going to help you. I think networking, I mean, this is what we're doing right now. Um, what you have, uh, it, that's very important. It's, it's really a foundation for how you build relations, how you learn more about different areas, and how you connect with people. Because connection is everything. I think, you know, that's how business, you know, build. Business are built on relationships. And I think that's a very important thing. I mean, talk about the NASA mission, going back to the moon this time to stay the first woman, you know, in 2024, you know, the next man, and then from there to Mars. We're not doing that alone. We're doing that in collaboration with industry, with academia, with other nations. So I think it's those relationships are critical for, you know, business. It doesn't matter what kind of business. Yeah, that's, that's really important what you mentioned. I, I remember first, um, you know, me coming here as a freshman, 18 year old, not knowing much, but those types of networks, you know, finding your group, your community, because us as engineers, usually we tend to be, or the engineering community tends to be very quiet, very to themselves, um, especially here, the community at Case can be, um, you know, everyone is trying the, their, to be excellent at their field and, and they, they don't ask questions, they want to figure it out themselves because they're engineers. So usually as, you know, as an academic immigrant myself, it's true, we have to find those, those network areas professionally and academically to, to figure out how to, to not only survive, but survive happily, you know, within a sense of community. And you were, uh, it, it's true here in Cleveland, there's a big Puerto Rican community or the, the majority of Latinos here in Cleveland is Puerto Rican. So I guess you felt kind of home. Uh, with the bakeries and the, the restaurants and all around you know, here. The, the, yeah, the, the, the bakeries were not a problem. That's, you know, that's kind of funny <laughs> to say that because that was probably the first thing I learned. Where's the, where's the bakery, right? Where's yes. the bakery? Where can you go and buy some, you know, what, what kind of grocery you can do where? So um, that, that was one of the lessons learned and, and quickly learned that, that lesson. Um, but I think, you know, overall, Anytime that you go through a transition, every time that, you know, you go, I mean, it, just even, you know, going from, um, you know, high school to college, there's a transition there. You know, you're going to get, you know, another circle of uh, individuals around you. It's a different environment and um, you have to learn, you have to adapt, um, and that's how you get better and that's how you progress, right? So, so there's all these steps that are kind of fundamental and it doesn't matter what you're going to have to experience that um, in any kind of uh, transition. Um, yeah. This yeah, is that, this just something that we all go through. Yeah, that's true. And, and moving to, to that professional growth and transition. So you from engineering to more managerial positions, you held multiple positions at NASA since 1983, from chief of the electrochemistry branch, all the way to the deputy director of research and then deputy direct, uh, director of the whole uh, Glenn Center. And even you participated in a one-year fellowship uh, to teach in your alma mater in Puerto Rico. Um, and something that, that quite interests me was uh, your ability to take advantage of those opportunities uh, from a technical role, then to leadership, then to higher management. And, you know, management in the level of huge responsibility of managing 3,000 employees, thousands of projects, um, $900 million annual budget. So in that sense, uh, can you tell us how you handle those key transitions and tough decisions moving upward within NASA and how your technical background as an engineer help you in those key moments? So uh, the first thing is that all of you are thinking, well, she cannot keep a job. All right. So that's, that's true. Obviously, I cannot keep a job. Um, but you know, <laughs> yeah, in reality, um, you know, you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, my interest in the junior year when I was in college about research. So you know, research, you, you identify with, you know, some individuals in engineering gets more into the development 
or in the systems, you know, the integration. I was more into the research. And um, when I started with NASA, I started the research. And, you know, as I said before, continuous education, you know, research was kind of my passion. I wanted, you know, be there. But there's also something to say about mentors. And sometimes mentors see something in you that you don't see in yourself, right? Because we get, I get, I got, maybe I should speak for myself, but I, I got very um, focused in terms of this is what I want to do, right? I want to do research. I want my master. I want my PhD. Um, and one good day, um, one of these, um, one manager came to me and said, hey, you know what, we have this opportunity. Uh, we're going to have these uh, independent assessment teams and, and we want you to join us in one of those teams. And um, to tell you the truth, I was not aware of what was the magnitude of these teams. And it turned out to be was an agency team, was, you know, selected individuals that were going to do some independent assessment. And that's how I kind of was introduced to the idea of um, working in more kind of a strategic and kind of um, bigger um, goals that was not just, you know, the aspect of a research, I'm leading a team, you know, working on research, it was more kind of in the management and a strategy, strategy uh, area. And to tell you the truth, I really like it. Um, you know, some individuals obviously gave me feedback, time of, you know, gave me uh, some input. Um, some of those individuals kind of reached out and said, hey, you know what, um, we want you to help on this area too. So one thing led to the other. And I start kind of drifting a little bit from, from the research and more into the leadership, um, managing team, that kind of um, aspect. So when I finished my, uh, my PhD, they asked me, hey, um, we need some help with a project. Uh, could you switch to lead a project? And I was like, okay, I, I can manage a task, that's, that's good. I really like it. I really like it. Um, and I move into more kind of a project environment. And from there, um, you know, I went back to University of Puerto Rico as part of a NASA program. And um, I taught in the uh, chemical engineer department out there. So for those of you that are listening, if you want to really learn something, teach something. Teaching is very, very tough. You, you learn quite a bit. You think you know, <laughs> just try teaching. You learn quite a bit about that. That was another experience. Um, I was teaching the, uh, senior, one of the senior classes out there. And um, it, it was really very rewarding. It was outstanding. So when I came back, um, I, uh, the, the position that, um, the, the, the group that I started with working with electrochemistry branch, the you know, head of that organization um, retired. So that position was open. So I applied and that's how I finished being, you know, the branch chief for that organization. That's how I started my supervision um, role. And that's another thing, you know, um, project management, supervision, research, you got to find out what, you know, is your passion, what really you like about it, because all of those things, they're not for everyone, right? So you gotta find out what will you like because that's where you're gonna excel. So I got more into the supervision. I really like that. And um, one thing led to the other and then I started, you know, kind of um, getting different roles within the organization, finished being the, uh, the uh, uh, director of the Office of Aeronautics, uh, from there to deputy of um, research and engineering, deputy director and then director. Um, I can tell you that in each one of those roles, I learned quite a bit. Um, each one of those roles, I went in humble and knowing that I didn't know everything. Um, so you have to surround yourself with people that have the strength um, where you have weaknesses. Um, you also have to be, um, got to study um, the environment, the people, everything that is going around you because each one of those positions challenged me to learn more about the organization more about the people, more what I was responsible of. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I rely on mentors, people that, you know, have had their role before or that they were in another role and were always uh, willing to, uh, to help me in terms of just having a conversation. And, you know, the best mentor ask you questions, don't give you uh, direction in terms of what to do. And I think I learned quite a bit from, from some of those mentors. Uh, the other thing is I never dreamed it was not um, like I said, you know, I'm going to be center director one day. 
Uh, it was just a matter of opportunities and challenges, and um, I was willing to take the risk. And some other individuals were willing to take the risk with me as well. I think it goes both ways. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite, quite, quite very interesting, very interesting. inspiring. inspiring. Well, someone well, that, that, that just wants, wants to, you know, enter as a, you know, to the workforce in industry or, or whatever, why not? It's always that risk to balance the risk between the opportunity and coming as a researcher myself with it, you know, extensive research undergrad and then grad school, kind of like decide, oh, what's, what's your technical skills that you learn in school, but what you truly passion of. For example, me, it's, you know, talking, networking, you know, making sure people excel to their potential within a group, for example. So I understand that um, it's really interesting that you manage that uh, to decide and take those risks and move forward in your career. But uh, I, I kind of want to know how the case education, yeah, you, you, you graduated in 2018, but what was your role here at case specifically? Um, I don't know if you can tell us a little bit of the research you did, but also how you enjoy your time at case. I would like to say also, what was your Latino experience here at case Western? Mm -hmm. Because how, since our group is pretty new, there was not a lot of knowledge of the Latino community on campus. So what was your role here at the school? What type of research you did and, and how you enjoyed it? So I think, you know, um, it was a little bit different from, you know, when you go full time, full time, all the time. I was still working. Um, I was also starting to, you know, have a family. So I um, just have my first son. Um, I was, you know, going for my, you know, PhD. Um, NASA gave me one year to do, you know, the resident. So that year I was back and forth between, you know, my residence and, you know, um, case. And one of the things is, you know, for some reason, I, I always remember the group of individual class, because when we were in the class, we were very cohesive. Um, obviously, you know, everybody has different uh, responsibilities and the majority of them were at campus. So that was a disadvantage for me because once the, you know, courses were done, Unless there was a seminar or something, I will, you know, jump in the car and just drive home because I have, you know, a two years old that was waiting for me at home. So I think, you know, and, and I have to study and I have to do all these things. So I needed to manage my time really wisely. Um, and then after the year of residence, then I was, you know, still doing research. Um, obviously, the research was part of NASA, but I have to, you know, do all the things that you know, everybody has to do when they go to graduate school. I was also working and I have a two years, you know, old, old son at home and a husband. So, you know, talk about managing dynamic. Um, but one of the things I, I don't remember his name, but I remember there was another um, Hispanic in the class. And I, if I remember correctly, I think he was from, uh, from Mexico. I may be wrong on that one. Um, I know he was from some place in Latin America. And um, we talked quite a bit, obviously being, you know, have a lot of, you know, similarities in terms of, you know, the language, you know, what we were through. But to tell you the truth, I, I didn't have the experience in terms of having like the organization like you guys have now. I think that is superb. That is great. I think what you're doing really is bringing the community together. And not just the community of, you know, the Hispanic, but anyone that wants to know something about, you know, the community. It doesn't matter who it is. I mean, if it's alumni or if that, you know, the ones that are going through the process right now. I think there's a lot of lessons learned. There's a lot of transfer of knowledge that this organization really provide that avenue or, you know, opportunity for us to be engaged. So I think, you know, that's one of the things that I probably want. I take, you know, full ownership. I was not exploring because, again, I, I have things to do, right? Um, but at the same time, it's different times. And um, I think what you're doing is just outstanding. And I'm so honored to be part of this discussion today. Thank you so much for, for reaching out. It's, it's just wonderful. No, yeah. Uh, thank to you, thanks to you because um, having you as a, as a member of our community really inspire other folks, especially undergraduates, graduates that are interested in not, not just engineering, but STEM as a whole. They, they have people in mathematics, people in computer science that we had in my experience with, with uh, SHIP, uh, the Society of Hispanic Professional mm -hmm. Engineers, we have gathered, or, or when I was an undergrad, our job was to gather not just engineers within a community because CASE as a smaller school, uh, even though we have more grad students than undergrads, can be quite isolating. And, and, and even 
as you mentioned, grad students come from different age groups and different responsibilities, and some of them are just part-time, full-time. So um, kind of like focusing on not just uh, focusing on engineering, but broader bringing all the community together of STEM, which is kind of very important, especially Latina in STEM. Um, for example, in SHIP, we have this SHIPTINA track that now uh, the undergraduates have been pushing towards you know, getting those, um, not just um, uh, engineers, but people in computer science and, and the mathematics background. So changing to the mentorship and community aspect, um, you mentioned you know, uh, taking part of a mentorship, networking, it's, it's vital. To, to your personal and professional success. And what interests me was you worked as deputy director under Dr. Cavandi, um, former astronaut and center director. Uh, and she took kind of like a, a similar path. And in the past, you mentioned that she was a great influence on you and she was a mentor to you and kind of like guide you through the process of higher leadership. So what was, what was that mentorship like? What was that personal relationship? Because in higher level positions, I imagine, I just imagine, that it can be quite isolating because you're in charge of a whole organization, but it's your responsibility directly. So how, how was it and what was the key to, to your success? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know where you read that, but obviously um, right to the, uh, to the point. I think, you know, um, Dr. Cavandi, first of all, as a professional, she's, you know, one of the kind. Um, and the majority of the astronauts are like that. I mean, their personality, their achievement is just amazing. They're really uh, very unique individuals. Um, I was very fortunate to have her as my boss, but also as a mentor. I think, you know, she's, um, and, you know, some of you probably have interacted with her, but one thing about her is that, you know, she's really calm. And I think for some of us, especially me, um, that calmness is always welcome. Because at times, you know, you get so intense and, and the intensity is good, but you got to moderate that intensity. Um, it's, it's just that your passion sometimes take the best out of you. So I think one of the things that I learned with her was just to, you know, stay calm, um, listen a little bit more and uh, then act. Um, also, you know, sometimes, you know, the best mentor I talk about, you know, just asking questions. So that's one thing. The other thing is just the conversation. Just natural conversations, I think, help a lot. So I think, you know, that's one thing that, um, you know, I, I really appreciated from her. Um, not just that I was, you know, I was, you know, she was my supervisor, but the opportunity to watch and learn from someone that has that role. And then, you know, later on when I have, you know, to step up in that position, you know, she was the first one to say, you're ready. And I was like, oh, I'm not so sure. I said, no, you're ready. Um, so I think, you know, that encouragement, um, those words that sometimes, you know, we are probably very hard on ourselves, always help. Having someone that believes on you and is willing to tell you, you know, just watch for good things, but, you know, just go for it. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I, I hope I'm doing for others, because I always think, you know, mentoring is also two-way street. You know, I can be your, you know, uh, mentor. Um, but I will learn as much from you as hopefully you learn from me because that's, you know, that's what, it, you know, that is where it makes the difference. When we develop this relationship with mentors and mentee, that everybody is learning and that we get a different perspective because even with all my experience, right, um, I maybe get to use to find the same solution or apply the same solution to the problem talking to someone else that is not biased and hasn't been with those experience may open another dimension of how can I look at that problem in a different way. So I think, you know, mentors, mentees is, is very important. And I really, really um, ask all of you, if you don't have a mentor, find a mentor. If you're not a mentor, be a mentor. I think um, there's a lot of learning um, that we as a community, we as an organization and we as a nation can learn from from the mentors. Yeah, and I, and I relate to that aspect that you mentioned of, um, you know, staying calm and listen and take a step back because I, I, I relate because me as, as Mexican, we tend to have this hectic life of having this strong character and, you know, and, and have this accent that it's kind of tough and like you're, you're screaming at people, but not really. Right, uh, right. So, so it's, it's, for me, it's more important to they, I have heard some, some other people that call it assimilate to where you at. And 
But for me, as you mentioned, is assimilate, but don't lose your identity. Because yeah, the, those, those mm-hmm. traits that you have as a Latino can help you, you know, push you to a, a lots of different problems, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, Alberto, you say something really critical. Um, thank you for, for, you know, raising that, is that, you know, sometimes we have to feel comfortable being uncomfortable. So let me tell you what is that. Um, you know, we're very comfortable the way we are, but sometimes we have to look at, you know, um, maybe this is not the best way to act or behave or try to have a negotiation. And we have probably to adapt, you know, not assimilate, but adapt a different style because otherwise we're not going to get our point across. So I think we have to make sure that we are open and aware of what are those triggers that we have that yes, they can get us in good places, but they also can get us in bad places. So that awareness about what triggers you, uh, what makes you so good, um, too, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So you gotta, you gotta find that you know, um, level that is um, maybe a little bit uncomfortable because it's not the way you wanna act, but it's the way that people will listen to you. So you got to have to learn a little bit of how to adapt and, uh, and tailor a little bit of your style because otherwise um, you're not going to be very effective. And, and I think that's one thing that we all learn. Um, and I still you know, struggle with that, especially when we get in stress or something that really is very important to us. We try to go with the style that we feel the most comfortable. But that may not be the style that is really the style that some other people would be listening to. So I think we've got to learn um, a little bit more about our strengths and weaknesses so we can adapt and tailor those uh, for the audience that we're trying to get to. That's, that's very interesting, the, the trigger part of mm-hmm. don't let those triggers defeat you and don't let those triggers blind you and, and make you biased. So to end this conversation uh, before the questions, I would just say what message, because uh, in the audience, I don't know, but we have uh, from Latino or Latinas uh, that are, you know, undergraduates, graduate students, alumni, and the community alike. So what advice or message? We talk about adaptability, we talk about knowing your strengths, but what type of, um, you know, other advice can you give uh, for people that are in STEM fields? And, you know, how important it is that Hispanic representation in huge projects, like, for example, the current NASA Artemis 2024 program, mm-hmm. which is a big push in NASA. So I think, you know, uh, first of all, um, it doesn't matter which field you are, be the best you can be. Prepare yourself. Don't be afraid of taking risk. Because if you don't take risk, you know, will never know how much you can do or contribute to anything. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, family, you know, your personal life or your professional life. Um, and be willing to take that risk. But prepare yourself to take those risks. You know, there's always to win something to lose in any decisions that we make. Um, but more important for some of you that are very hard on yourself, don't be so hard on yourself. Give yourself a chance. Give yourself an okay to fail because from failure, we learn quite a bit. So don't be afraid to fail because failure is part of, you know, human being is part of the learning and the growing process. Um, go for it. You have it on it. You can, absolutely. We all have that potential. We just have to be patient with ourselves, prepare ourselves, and go for it. That's, that's fantastic. That's great. I think our conversation can shift now to uh, the Q&A portion of this uh, event. Uh, I will go through the comment chat. You can now have the opportunity to, I'm getting really dark here. The light is <laughs> giving me a bad thing. Uh, but um, I will start by a question from Aaron Reese. Sorry if I butchered your name, but Aaron Reese. Uh, he he asked, uh, this person asked, how do you think the experience for a female and minority STEM student has changed in the engineering field in recent years? So I think, you know, um, overall, we can see more um, females and and minority um, individuals getting into engineering. I still, we have um, a long way to go. I think we have to make sure that we provide um, the experiences 
and that we all do outreach to tell students that, you know, the first thing for many students is that math and science first are boring and or are hard. So we have to make sure that we all do our part to show that that's not, you know, technology is all around us. Um, it's a matter of, you know, how they get uh, introduced, but what kind of hands-on experience we have. Um, I think we have made a lot of progress. I think we have a lot of more progress to make. Um, keep an eye on 2024. I think that's going to be, we're going to be rewriting history when we have the first woman on the moon in 2024, the next man. But more than anything, we're going to inspire another generation of explorers. So let's make sure that we all do our part to take that big event and make it part of us and, you know, the legacy that we're living. That's great. Um, Hiram asks, uh, what would be some leadership tips you will give to other alumni or students as they move into higher level roles in their careers? I think, you know, one of the things that we all have to uh, look into, um, any opportunities that you have to um, an assessment, you know, um, any time of um, input in terms of areas that you need development with, I would say, go for it. Um, that is very important because you know, the, the better that you know yourself, the better that you prepare yourself, the more opportunities you're going to have. In leadership, the soft skills are critical. The technical skills are your foundation. Don't forget about that. It doesn't matter which field. Now you have to work on your soft skills. Negotiation, interpersonal skills, you know, how you react on challenges, how you, you know, you, you manage risk. All those things are the soft skills you got to get a feeling for those and those some of them you got to practice and then you're going to have to um, learn from things that didn't go that well how you can make it better next time that you go around for leadership the soft skills you got to work on those all right um great uh another from crystal crosby uh, she asks, are there some new, exciting, and innovative things happening at NASA? And can you tell us uh, more about them? Well, um, there's one of them that is my favorite. It's called Shape Memory Alloys. And it's this material that you can use for you know, different purposes. Two things that we're doing with this material right now, we're looking at you know, um, tires for rubber. One of the things that the tires, you know, is kind of a disadvantage, right, is that you cannot go that far. But with these shape memory alloys tires, you can go really, really far. Um, the other thing is, if you look at that technology to applications on Earth, imagine that you have a tire that doesn't need air, and it doesn't get, if you have a pothole, you can go through it, and it's not going to get punctured. So I think that's, those are a real benefit. Um, that same material is being used in air, you know, uh, aviation to replace actuators. And instead of having moving parts, you know, the temperature changes of those materials will allow you to move the wings so, or winglets. That's, um, that's a great application. So shape memory alloys is really exciting uh, technology. Read about it. Uh, there's a couple of articles on, on the uh, web page, NASA web page, on the applications for shape memory alloys. Great. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And don't start me on that one because we can be here for 10 hours, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once we start doing our research and innovation, it's, you know, even, even a NASA, which is just one center, has multiple. Yeah, there's a lot of technologies out there. Yeah, that's totally true. Um, uh, Andrew Torres asks, Latinos make up an increasing share of students in the U.S. Do you think large industries in STEM are prepared for young Latino professionals? Um, I would say, why not? Um, I think, you know, um, the preparation and everything that you're doing, I mean, all of you are entering the workforce. So yes, absolutely. I think we just have to create more and more opportunities and make sure that um, we all do our part to make sure that, you know, we have great contributions to uh, industry, you know, the federal government, uh, look around. I mean, CHEP and um, what is the other organization? Um, the, Hinak, um, uh, they're me. not gonna like me. There's a number of organizations that recognize all the talent that is out there for Latinos in STEM. Um, so that gives you an indicator of you know how many um, great talent is out there to you know infuse into um, all the companies. Okay, um, I think we had another one from Margaret way back. 
Um, how are online engineering classes working and are any classes much harder online compared to physically in the engineering building or lab? I don't know if she refers to at case or, or maybe you can tell us how NASA Oh, well, okay. Them. So I think, you know, probably, um, you know, remember this was many, many years ago. So there was no online classes. Everything was at, you know, uh, physically on the building. So there was no online engineering classes. All was at uh, case. Um, so it, it was, you know, there's not like today. Today we'll, we'll have probably a combination of online and, you know, uh, the ability to go to the, uh, to the buildings to, uh, to take classes. So it was different. It was a little bit different. There's one piece here that said, what would you, what you do for fun in Cleveland pre-pandemic? So I think, you know, one of the things that we didn't talk about, Alberto, is, um, you know, balance life and work, your know, work and life balance and work and, you know, um, college years, all of that, you've got to find a balance in, um, you know, studying or working is critical, it's important, you got to do your best, but you also have to find time for yourself. Um, that is a very important aspect of who we are and how we balance, you know, the emotional, the physical stage, all of that. Um, I like biking. Um, I was doing CrossFit before pan pre-pandemic. I'm not doing that these days. I'm just running and doing bike. But um, you got to find what are those things. You know, some people is music. Um, some people is, you know, uh, yoga or Zumba or meditation. Find out what are those things that you can create this balance between working and um, all the things. Because you, you got you to gotta achieve that balance. And family. Um, make sure that you make time for your family, for what is important to you, uh, for your friends. You got to have that balance. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, and I will just say, for example, what was your main, uh, you know, things changed since March. And um, I think the whole, or this is, you know, my personal mm -hmm. question, you know, um, it will, things will change in, in terms of in industry and in private and big organization as yours, how we handle such things as big disruptions. And it can be from natural disasters to pandemics to all these challenges are external to an organization. So you as a leader of big you know, NASA center, how do you think you will handle future disruptions in the daily life of, of your employees and, and of, of your organization? So I don't think there's one answer that I can give you in terms of how, but I can tell you what I would do different. I think we have learned quite a bit about teleworking, about the ability of people to balance how much time they have to be on site, how much time they can, you know, support from being into, you know, any other location. So I think we have learned quite a bit about what the technology um, can do for us these days. I mean, just having this you know, um, chat right now, you know, if this is on her, we probably would not have been done that if we would not be in a pandemic. I probably would be physically out there, right, which is great, but this is an opportunity to. Um, so I think, you know, the tools, the technical tools that we have now, I think we have had um, quite a bit of experience with it. Um, the other thing is in terms of, you know, what is important. I think we also have learned quite a bit about, you know, employees and what they're doing right now. I am so proud of every single member of my team. They have been superb. And I know everybody's in a different place. Um, I try to have a virtual every week. Now I move it every two weeks just to reach out and tell them what I know. Because in times of uncertainty, people at least want to have some, you know, you know, if I don't know the answer, I should say, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to look for that answer. So I think, you know, I have learned personally quite a bit about, um, you know, relationship, you know, how to stay connected with the employees, how to stay connected with family and friends. I think we have to make uh, extra for these days to do that um, because it's, it's, it's just a different environment. It's something that none of us were, you know, planning to. We were all thrown into this and everybody's kind of learning a little bit. But I am very, very proud of, you know, every single employee at NASA and the way that we have responded to this pandemic. And um, it's, it's just a learning. Um, at the same time, is, um, is there's a lot of unknowns. And we human beings don't like to deal with the unknowns. Um, this, this is something that we like. 
you know, we like the planning. We, we know, we want to know what is next. Um, and in this case, there's a lot of unknowns out there. Yeah, and I think um, that's great. Uh, great to hear. Um, I think the last question will go to um, Lisa Paul. She wants to know how to keep her kids motivated to pursue STEM. Uh, <clears throat> you know, that's... Um, that's one of the areas that, you know, we at NASA, we have been trying how to keep the motivation of the STEM. So a couple of things. The first one is, you know, let's not talk about the math by the sake of math, but let's talk about how that relates to something. Um, use hands-on experiences, um, make it fun. I think, you know, for um, students, make it fun, make it part of something that they can see, they get a product out. I think that's one way. Um, the other thing is stories, things that are interesting. Sometimes, you know, just a video, especially for, you know, some students or some kids, videos are a good way to say, hey, look, you know, this uh, and this work that way, right? So you kind of do an education moment when you have that opportunity to show how something works. I mean, the iPad or, you know, a video, whatever it is, just use that as a teachable moment to see how science and math is behind that without using the equations, please. Because the equations scare everyone out. Let's not use the equations. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's true. That's true. But it, they're not that scary. But some of them, once you get to high mm -hmm. level, it's just words. They're, they're letters. <laughs> and it's, like, it's very, yeah, right. Absolutely. It's very scary. <laughs> but, but we can tackle it now. Um, okay. So I guess we have, uh, we're almost done. Um, thank you, um, Marla, Dr. Perez-Davis. For, for this conversation. I really learn a lot. I have my notes. I learn a lot of things, especially I, I will use them towards my advantage. I hope everyone here will use your words in, in their lives. And I will pass it to, I think Andrew will want to say some um, words at the end about our future events during homecoming. Um, so yeah, Andrew. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, thank you. Just gracias, uh, Marla y Beto. Um, thank you so much uh, to you both um, for, for having this conversation and, and sharing this with us. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Beto talked about homecoming events and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I think something that um, you said, Marla, which I really appreciated, which is that the, this pandemic has allowed us to uh, really rethink how uh, we're able to, to organize ourselves and how we might not have had this meeting, or at least I might not have been able to participate um, because I'm in, in Los Angeles, right? And I think most of you are in Cleveland or Northeast Ohio. Um, so, you know, big thank you to everyone who was involved in putting this together. And, uh, and, and you know, thankful for technology to be able to do this in the first place. So the, the uh, events we have during homecoming, right? We know uh, Case alum and, and students uh, know that this year, well, we're going virtual, right? Um, and there's plenty of events going on. So uh, Shane will give you the link uh, for where to go to learn more. I want uh, two events that uh, the Latinx Alumni Association is hosting that we'd like you to uh, be a part of if you're able to. The first is this Saturday. Uh, uh, it's gonna be on Zoom, right? Uh, two to four Eastern time. So 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And this is a critical discussion on dismantling anti-blackness in the Latinx community. Um, we think it's gonna be a really important conversation and we really appreciate uh, everyone's participation in, in that conversation. Uh, and then on Sunday, we have an event uh, that's uh, our sort of virtual meetup, right? So for the past uh, four years, this will be, I think the, the fourth year that we get to celebrate homecoming as uh, Latina. Uh, I, um, Hiram helped come up with this uh, crew, Latinx Familia. Um, so we're looking forward to coming together on Sunday. Uh, that'll be from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern, also on Zoom. And uh, we want to have you there as well. You can find out about these events uh, at the homecoming website that Sham will give you, or you can visit our Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook and look up Case Western Reserve University Latinx alumni, you'll find us. That's Latinx, L-A-T-I-N-X. Um, and with that, thank you both again.